Simon. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about this idea I've come up with or I've been thinking about for a while called data is a soft science. A little bit about me. I'm Simon Carrier, this guy. The colour scheme for my talk has been chosen exclusively to complement this selfie, which is my, my house <laughs> in New Zealand, that yellow colour. So it's all purple and yellow, and it looks, well, I hope you agree, it looks great. Um, so about me, I am a data scientist, um, and I started my data science career working for a company called Trade Me, which in New Zealand is a really big deal, and everywhere else in the world is completely unheard of. Um, one of the things that trade, it's kind of like Gumtree, but slightly cooler. Um, yeah, slightly. Um, one of the things that Trade Me does is uh, sell, uh, they do listings for properties. And one of the things that you can do on Trade Me's property section is look at houses and see how much you think, how much we estimate they're going to sell for. Um, so I, the, my sort of first data science, like machine learning-y thing that I did was build the property price estimator for Trade Me. And so this is kind of a, a, a clip of that there with me snooping on my neighbor's house. And I, I assure you that that is a, a ridiculous, but yet somewhat accurate estimate of the price of a house on my street. So that's, um, that's a thing that I built. I learnt a lot, like learnt how to use Python and learnt about linear regression and a whole lot of other things. That kind of was the start of my data science career. I'd sort of done some data analysis stuff, writing SQL queries before that, but that's kind of where it all started. Since then I kind of learnt a lot in my own time, uh, working on some projects. This is a thing that I made with the help of a lot of friends. Um, it's called moviemaths.com. You can, you can go to moviemaths.com on your phone right now, but maybe stagger it out because my DevOps skills are marginal, so if you all go at once. Anyway, what it does is it takes, I got data from IMDB about the tags of movies and then kind of used a bunch of mathy stuff to turn it into what, like a semantic vector. And then you can add those vectors together and find a third movie that's like similar to that. So, for example, here we've got John Wayne's Chisholm plus Aliens equals Cowboys and Aliens, right? Like Cowboys plus Aliens equals cow Cowboys and Aliens. There's cool stuff like um, uh, Point Break plus Cars equals Fast and the Furious. Because <laughs> they're, they're, they're the same movie. It's, it's really good. Is it yeah. Sorry? Does it multiplication? I guess you could do multiplication. I don't know what would... Like, theoretically, I don't know what that would mean. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, give it, give it. I mean, the user interface will, like, it does subtraction and, and addition at the moment, but come, coming soon, log a feature request. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> um, uh, what else? Oh, so now I work for Xero, uh, one of Zendesk's satisfied customers. Um, we do, like, accounting software. Um, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> um, we've got an office in Melbourne, which you should all go and apply for jobs at, because we're doing exciting stuff like this. Um, we make accounting software, which is, accounting is not the most exciting job in the world. I'm sorry, it's true. Like, y even accountants will tell you that. There's a lot of accounting stuff that is not that interesting. And so, one of the things that we're trying to do at Zero is make it so that accountants can focus on doing the interesting bit of their job and not have to do some of the, the boring bits of their job. Data entry, sort of finding like anomalies, the sort of boring stuff that a computer should be able to do. And so part of my job at Xero is to help build that kind of product. Um, I think I've got an example of that here. Oh yeah, I do. Look, so this is someone making a bill in Xero and they're uh, saying, or we love baking, they're making a, oh, they're sending a, they've got a bill from someone, and they're saying, oh, it's a bill for some flour. And then, oh, the account, it popped up there. They populated it. See, and then they're going to do it again, and then put a thing, and then, see, the account code came up. We did that. <laughs> we, we, we built a little machine learning thing that looks at how they entered their data, how they did bills in the past, and predicts how they did it how they, they should do it now. And we did that, and it's quite accurate, and it's really cool. 
Um, so that's the kind of thing that we want to do more of. Um, but it's also some things that raise a whole lot of questions for me about how we know if we're doing a, a good job. And it started me down this path of thinking about what we're doing as data scientists. And that's kind of where this talk came from. So that's what I'm going to get to. With a bit of a digression, because my background is not in data science. I didn't go to university to do stats or maths or uh, comp sci or anything. I've got a social anthropology degree. Um, and that has kind of, as well as making me hugely insecure about most of what I do, <laughs> it's, it's, it's also given me, like, kind of, I think, some strengths. You know, it's kind of changed the perspective that I have on the work that I do. And I think it's got some benefits that I would kind of like to share with you. So we're going to do a little digression into anthropology and what anthropology is about. Um, this is Bronislaw Mal Malinowski. He's kind of one of the OGs of social anthropology. And he's demonstrating here for you one of the sort of key ideas of social anthropology, which is uh, participant observation or ethnography. He's uh, in the Trobriand Islands here, hanging out with some people, talking to them about their lives, trying to understand what is cool to them, you know, like trying to understand what their lives are like uh, by living with them and talking to them. And that's kind of the, the big deal of anthropology is that idea of going and talking to people and understanding the world from their point of view. He's also kind of demonstrating one of the very problematic aspects of social anthropology, at least historically, which is that it's mostly about very educated white people going and studying black people, which has got some kind of troubling connotations and hasn't always dealt with that super well. Anyway, moving on. I'm going to tell you a story. It's kind of one of anthropology's founding myths. And it's, it's set here in your Yorant land up in sort of North Queensland. But I really want to stress to you that it's not a Yur Yorant story. And it's not really even about the Yur Yorant people because the story, it doesn't, we didn't ask them what their experience was of this story. It's a story that anthropologists tell to explain why anthropologists do the work that they do. <coughs> so the story takes place in the sorry, early 1930s when there was a, a Christian mission to this, at the time, reasonably unsettled part of, you know, like, settled obviously by the Yoron people who were living there quite happily, but there weren't that many white people there, so it was consequently unsettled. Um, but there was a Christian mission there with a farm, and they wanted to encourage Yur Yorant people to come and work on their farm. So they wanted to give them some kind of payment or gift in exchange for their work. And they were, it was the 1930s, so they were kind of trying to give them some gift that would not disrupt their lives too much, something that would be useful to them, but not dangerous for them. And they settled on giving them steel axes. The Yur Yorant people already had stone axes. And so they, they, they figured that a steel axe was like a stone axe, except stayed sharper for longer. It, was, uh, it would make their daily lives easier without changing fundamentally what they could do. Uh, but they were really wrong. Uh, the steel axes had a catastrophic effect on the Yur Yorant way of life for two reasons. Uh, one is that a, st a stone axe is quite hard to make. So the people in Yur Yorant villages who had stone axes were the senior people, mostly senior men. They were their leaders. And if you wanted to use a stone axe, you had to go to someone, one, some senior member of the village and ask to borrow their axe. And that gave them what anthropologists call social capital, right? This idea, it gave them a role in their village as leaders. It gave, and who asked to borrow your axe kind of was a signifier of your influence in the, in the village. And so when, with these steel axes, mostly it was young men and women who were going to work on the farm. So suddenly all these young people had axes and didn't need to borrow the old men's axes anymore. And so the whole social structure of the village was put into disarray by this, uh, by the introduction of these axes. And then the second reason that the axes were disruptive was it turns out that the 
the stone that was used in these stone axes didn't come from the coast here. It actually came from hundreds of miles inland and was traded to the coast by a series of centuries-old trading partnerships where they would trade uh, spears made from stingray barbs from the coast all the way inland to get the stone which would come out. So this village suddenly dropped out of that trading network. They didn't need the stone anymore, which meant they didn't trade the string, stingray barb spears, which meant that villages all for miles into the interior suddenly couldn't get access anymore. So it wasn't just disruptive for this village, it was actually disruptive for Huron people all over the, the country. So I guess this story is kind of a, a parable, right? And for anthropologists, it's a parable about why it's important to understand the people you're working with. And I think for us working in software, it's kind of also maybe a parable about the, the fact that we work with very complex systems and we make changes to those systems, hoping that they will improve things for people. But unless we understand those systems really well and understand them from the point of view of the people who are using them, we risk introducing cat catastrophic changes. So that's why I'm interested in understanding the people behind the data that I'm looking at. And that's what I think this, uh, this social anthropology background kind of helps me with. And obviously I'm not alone in that. There's a lot of other people who are doing sort of similar work or having similar thoughts. Uh, one of them is this woman called Tricia Wang, who talks about thick data, and this idea of kind of doing ethnography of data. Um, Tricia Wang was a uh, user experience researcher for uh, Motorola, I think, and worked in China with small business people there and trying to understand the role of their phones in their business. And she argued that Motorola fundamentally misunderstood that market and consequently you don't find a lot of Motorola phones anymore. Um, her idea of thick data, well, I won't make you read that, but it's basically the idea that data is like one, that thick data is this idea of seeing the people behind the data, that there's a whole lot of supporting information that can help you understand not only what the data says, but what it means. Um, she calls it thick data, this is a sort of nerdy anthropologist digression, but she calls it thick data in reference to kind of one of the other sort of founding documents of modern social anthropology, which is uh, this idea of thick description, which comes from Clifford Geertz, who wrote an essay called Notes on the Balinese Cockfight, which you should read, by the way, because it's really readable and really interesting and kind of fun. It's got some cool stories in there about uh, living in Bali and going to cockfights, which were, and still are, I think, illegal, and sort of running from the police and hiding in people's villages. To, and, uh, to, um. What he talks about in that essay is the way that by looking at this kind of simple event in Balinese life, the, the cockfight, you can kind of see it as a microcosm of a whole lot of bigger things in people's, in these people's lives. That, and he uses what he calls thick description, which is describing the events of this cockfight with reference to all the sort of symbology and meaning that the Balinese people brought to this event. So it's a really interesting way of seeing, seeing the events, but then also seeing all the, the meaning that comes from the, that sits behind those events. And so when Tricia Wang talks about thick data, she's talking about the same thing, so sort of seeing the data, but then seeing the people behind that data. Um, she came up with a little table here. Um, at the time that she was writing this, it was sort of at the peak of the buzz around big data. And so she was con contrasting thick data with, with big data. Um, and the particular thing that I'm interested in is this idea of revealing the social context of connections between data points. This idea that when you see something in your data, you're seeing people doing a thing. You know, the data gets into a system because a person hit a button somewhere, you know, like, and to be able to look through your spreadsheet or your like Python code and see that person sitting at their keyboard hitting a button, like that's, and understand what that meant to them at that time, like that's really interesting to me. And so that's kind of part two of my talk, which is human behavior through a data lens. 
Um, and I'm going to start with a kind of trivial but also adorable example, which is about dogs. So as part of learning to do, like improve my skills with data science and coding and things, I've been doing a lot of sort of side projects at home. And one of the things I did was I got a data set of dog registrations for six or seven years, which had the, the name of the dog and the breed of the dog. And I wanted to understand the relationship between dog names and dog breeds. And so I did the, the sort of naive thing first, which is I looked at the mo most common name for every dog breed. It turns out for uh, Scottish Terriers here, it's Buddy, Bella, and Max. And for this heartbreakingly adorable pit bull, it's Buddy, Bella, and Max. <laughs> <laughs> and then for this sweet little Shih Tzu, it's Buddy, Bella, and oh, Gizmo. Gizmo. <laughs> so, so there's something there. There's, but like, this was super disappointing to me, right? Because I know that people name their dogs different things based on the breed. There must be, like, I know that there's a pattern there. So I went looking deeper for it. And I did a lot of Googling and a lot of talking to people who actually know stats. And I came up with this, um, I, I realized that you could do a, an odds ratio, right? Like, how much more likely is this name given this breed? Right? Rather than the overall popularity, you could see the, uh, yeah, the relative likelihood based on the, the breed. And then use a thing called Fisher's exact test. I hope there's no actual statisticians here. Um, yeah, d which sort of tested whether it was a, a spurious example or a real. Anyway, I did some maths, and then I found the real pattern in there. So this uh, Scottish Terrier, they get called Duncan, Angus, and Piper, because they're Scottish. So they get Scottish names. You know, people get, are more likely to give them Scottish names. And then this is one of my favorite ones, because like, it kind of reveals the dichotomy of the, of the pit bull, which is that they get oh, Chopper nice. and Butch, <laughs> right? Yeah, but also Sweetie, because because they're well, they're so sweet. They're so oh, it breaks my heart. And then the Shih Tzu, obviously, it's it's all sweet. Gizmo, Benji, and Cuddles, right? Isn't that good? So I guess what I learned from this was that because I knew that that pattern was there, because I knew something about the relationship that people have with their dogs, I kind of knew something about the social context. I could go looking and find that pattern. But how often is it the case that you really understand that social context of your data before you look at it? How easy would it be to miss that if it was something to do with accountants and the account codes that they use or something? You know, something that I don't know and kind of don't find that interesting. Like, you know, like it would be very easy for me to miss that if I didn't know a lot about about accountants, if I didn't talk to accountants, if I didn't think about the social context of my data. So that's a thing that was sort of forefront in my mind when we did another project uh, around organization contacts. So there's this thing I showed you before, the thing where we were predicting account codes, and we did it pretty good. Uh, this was an early thing on bills where we were predicting the account code for bills, and we could get it right about 70% of the time. Now in production, we're a bit more accurate than that with some tweaking. Um, we wanted, so we're predicting the account code. We also wanted to predict the, uh, the contact. And this was for, sorry, this is for when people have spent money at the bank and they get a bank statement in and they're coding it in zero. And so we can predict the account pretty well. We wanted to know not only what account it was for, that we wanted to know who it was from. And they've got a list of contacts in their zero thing, and we wanted to just pick which contact it was for. But we sucked at it, right? It was really bad. We found, like, even though the bank statement says who the payment is from, and they've got a list of people that they get payments from all the time, we couldn't make a connection between them very accurately, or at least not accurately enough. And they, I couldn't understand why that was. So I did some digging. I found 60% of the contacts that people do business with, they use only once. So they, they never uh, deal with that person again. And I found, I did a thing, I calculated like an entropy 
threshold. Like, if you imagine that, like, someone mashing a keyboard is, like, more or less random data, and someone, whereas someone's, like, properly entered name is kind of quite structured information, you can, you can measure the difference between those two things to some extent. And I found about 20% of the contacts that people were entering were below this threshold where they were basically just mashing the keyboard. <laughs> and then about 35% of them, of the contacts, were copied directly from the bank data. And that data was often gibberish. <laughs> so what I f found, because so this was all very confusing to me until I talked to some user experience people and some customer service people, and they said, oh yeah, people don't actually care about that. People, it doesn't matter, because they're mostly one-off petty cash expenses. They never need to uh, know who it's from. So, yeah, we don't even, most organizations never keep that information and never use it. So what I realized was that this whole project that we'd spun up to predict this, the, the contact, was trying to solve a problem that was not even a problem for most of our users. The real problem was that we didn't have good ways of keeping structured data with our, uh, with our data. So, yeah, by looking at this thing and trying to understand the problem from the user's point of view, I realized that we were solving the wrong problem entirely. And that's kind of, I guess that's what I'm talking about when I say seeing the people behind the data is that e each one of these points in isolation wouldn't have given me that answer. It was only by sort of getting some questions from this data and then going and talking to some people, kind of combining the, the data analysis with some sort of human data that we got to this point of realizing we were solving the wrong problem. So that's seeing data, seeing people through a data lens. What got me started on talking about this though was some machine learning pro projects that we were working on. In in particular, that example I showed you before of uh, predicting account codes and some questions that came up from that. But I'm going to do another little digression. So this is a clip from one of the first uh, feature films ever made. It's called As Seen Through a Telescope. And what you're seeing here is about 20% of the film, because it's, it's very, very short. Um, it's kind of hard to see what's going on because it's so blurry and, and grainy, but it's kind of a guy looks through a telescope and then he sees this woman's ankle like, as he's, she's getting her shoelace tied. And you can see she's kind of in the background of that first shot and then he's getting the close-up. So he, what he's doing, he's, he, he's having a sneaky perv at this woman's ankle, <laughs> which at the time, I guess, was very risque. <laughs> so... This film actually has two huge innovations in filmmaking technology. The first is what we now call a cut, right? It's got one shot and then another shot. And the second shot kind of relates to what was in the first shot. There's a kind of a story happening there. Right? And we all as experienced film watchers sort of intuitively understand that, that if you see one thing and then another thing, there should be some kind of relationship between them, and we kind of look for that connection. And then the second innovation is this close-up, right? That we've got that kind of like mat around the thing, and then the, the close-up of her ankle, and we, and we understand that what we see in the second shot is what the guy sees in the, is, is what the guy is seeing through the telescope in the first shot. So that was two things that had never been done in film before. All the previous films have been single, long shots of like a train going past or someone walking. So this idea that you could take two different shots and put them together and make a story out of them, that was revolutionary for film. But people didn't understand this film straight away. They needed to learn how to read the film. The things that are very intuitive to us now, these, these are talking about shots and close-ups and things, that was all new. People didn't know how to do that, and they had to learn. Um, I think that the same is true for a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence products now, that we're asking users to learn a lot of sort of idioms and a lot of new things about how these technologies work in, in order to use them appropriately. Uh, so again, this is our ML product again, and you can see Hopefully, someone's going to enter a bill here. 
And then we're going to see the put in the date and a description. We've seen this before, but so there, there. Okay, see how the account is there? That account where it says uh, 469 rent, that's our machine learning prediction. Right? That's a guess that we have made on behalf of the user that says, we think based on what you've done in the past, this is what you should code it as. But we don't know that we're right. right? We're asking our user to check that to look at it and decide whether we've got it right or not. But how do they know to do that? How do they know how accurate we are? If they look at that and think, oh, rent's not actually right, should they trust themselves or should they trust us? And have we given them any information in order to make that decision? So this product is pretty popular and is doing quite well, but like all of these questions are like, sort of stuck with me. So we did a little research project to understand more about it. Um, this is one of the really interesting things that we found. So when we uh, built this, at first what we did was we deployed it in the background. So we didn't show anyone any predictions. We'd make a guess and then see, based on what they did, whether we got it right or not. But we didn't show them the prediction. We just, uh, we just measured in the background. And in that background, our accuracy was just shy of 90%. And this is over thousands of predictions, so we've got a very clear idea of our accuracy. Then we started showing the predictions to people. So instead of just measuring in the background, people saw a prediction and then made a choice about what to do. And our accuracy went up. So what's that about? What's going on there is that people saw a prediction and then made a different choice. They were going to choose one thing, and then, but because they saw our suggestion, they chose that instead. So we're influencing people's behavior. Now, some of the time, that's because they were going to get it wrong and we got it right. And hopefully that's most of the time, but we don't actually know. We've got no way of measuring that. We don't have any ground truth accuracy for this at all. We've just got what the user did. And it made me realize that we've, like the whole sort of paradigm of machine learning kind of takes this idea of a scored labeled data set as the truth. But when you're dealing with user data, when da users have created that data, some of them are not, account they're not professional accountants. They, our users sometimes get things wrong. And when we train a model based on that data, we're also we're going to introduce that error into our into our model as well. So this raised a whole question for me about like, when should we trust the data? How do we know if we've got things right? Uh, you know, what does right even mean? I also got really curious about whether our users understood how this product worked. So we talked to some customer service people and some user experience people and tried to uh, get a sense of what some of the mental models were that people were using to understand where this, these suggestions came from. And there, were three, there were three main schools of thought. There was this idea that Zero knows about accounting. So when we make a suggestion, we're saying, this is accounting best practice. This is what you should do. The second one is the idea that we look at other businesses and say, oh, other people have coded this thing this way, so you should do the same thing. And then the third one is, the, the correct one, which is the idea that we look at how they've done things in the past and suggest that they do the same thing in the future. Now that's the most common mental model, but we did find examples of people thinking in this other way. And that was really concerning to us because if people think that zero is suggesting accounting best practice to us, to them, firstly, if we get that wrong, it makes us look Really, it makes us look like we don't understand accounting. And secondly, if, if we get it wrong and they trust us, they lose trust in themselves, they stop feeling like they are the experts in their account. They, it hugely complicates their experience of using the product. So this idea that people don't understand where, this data, the, where these suggestions come from is really concerning to me, and it made me think a lot about how we can design these products better to communicate more 
about how we get, came to these conclusions. And I wish I could tell you that we had a, a great solution to that and we've got a new design rolling out, but actually these are still kind of active questions for us um, and some things that we're still working on and really curious to, I'm really curious to see where we come to. And there's some cool stuff coming that I think will be good. There's a fourth mental model that's far more common than uh, any of these three, and it's uh, this one. This <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most, most of our users didn't ever think about it. I was very, very excited when we rolled out this machine learning product. It was kind of one of the first ML products that we put into production. We're really nervous to see how people would react to it. And the truth is, most people didn't even notice it. They didn't see it as fundamentally different to the rest of Zero at all. It was just another feature. And that's kind of good, but it's also kind of worrying, right? That people didn't necessarily see this as different. They didn't see that this was something we weren't sure about or something that they needed to check. They just, and that their, their trust in that part of the product would reflect in their trust in the whole product. If we got this wrong, it would mean that they, they distrusted all of Zero. So that, again, made me really think about how we present this. Do we want this to be uh, you know, seamless and you know, just part of the whole product, or do we want to call it out? And there's kind of arguments in both directions, and I don't know what is right there, but I think it's something that we should all sort of think about. And lastly, there's this idea of making things better. We wanted to know if our product was making things better for people. We wanted to know, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is improve the lives of accountants and small business people by making them have to do less boring accounting. And like, this was kind of the mental model that I had for that, right? which was that, if, that our, our product would reduce the amount of time that they spent entering data. And it might introduce some errors that would mean that they spend a bit more time fixing problems. But if we could overall reduce the net of time spent, we'd be improving people's lives. It turns out this is completely wrong. Because time spent has a qualitative component. People hate fixing problems, and they especially hate fixing other people's problems. And if, they, if we've introduced an error that they have to fix, they resent that time spent so much more than the time spent doing data entry. That, so, and it made me realize that we can't measure that qualitative component w by looking at the data. You know, we have to understand that by talking to our users, by understanding our users. And so, it made me realize that the field of data science that I was in couldn't be concerned only with the data, that to understand whether this product was working, I had to have a bigger view. So that's, uh, machine learning and, and the criteria. <laughs> part four, and this part was kind of, uh, is a new addition to this talk uh, because I've got a little bit more time this evening. And it, so it gave me the opportunity to sort of uh, shim in sort of a rant that I've been giving. <laughs> so this is, is related to the topic of my talk, but it's also sort of a hobby horse that I've been on. So you are now my sort of semi-captive audience for my rant. So this is the idea of a research-led rather than data-driven. Data-driven is like a really, it's kind of the, considered the best practice for uh, tech companies now to be, everyone wants to be data-driven. And like, as a data professional, it's hard to sort of be against that idea. But I've got some considerable cynicism about it. And, and, and here's why. Um, this is kind of how I think data-driven data is supposed to work. I, got, I brought the dogs back because they're great. Um, so this is Sweetie, the cute executive of Dog Corp or whatever. And imagine that she says, like, we want more bickies. And we're a good data-driven organization, so the, the general mustache, Angus, he comes up with some, some metrics for that. He says, we'll increase bickies per week. That'll, that'll help get us more bickies. And then the woofing engineer down here cuddles. She says, okay, you know, she does some work, releases some code, and bickies per week is up 10%. And everyone's happy, 
right? That's kind of the data-driven model. You've got an outcome that you want to achieve, you set some metrics that measure that outcome, and then you look at whether what you're doing is affecting the, that metric. And that's like, who could complain about that, right? Like that's, that's a good way to conduct business. But my problem with, with data-driven as a concept is, where, is how often it looks like this instead, right? Like the, the, the G, G, the CE or whatever says, you know, they've, they've lost their tennis ball, right? And so you try barking at it, right? That's gonna, that's gonna sort, that, sort it out, right? It's a dog solution for everything. And then we're, we're a data-driven organization, so we, we measure our barking volume. And it's through the roof, so we must be doing a great job, right? <laughs> And I think that kind of, for me, that encapsulates the problem with data-driven <laughs> as, as an approach, is that it's very easy to measure things and see metrics going up and down and to ask every person in the organization to come up with some metrics that tell you, you know, you know we're all going to measure conversion rate or we're all going to measure uh, gross merchandise sale or something, you know, like, and everyone's going to tie things to that. But we all know that, A, a lot of the things that we do aren't going to influence that metric, at least not directly. But we, we know they're a good idea to do it, so we're going to go and do it anyway, and then sort of make up some reports that keep the executives happy. And the other thing is that we know that sometimes we can do things that don't influence that metric at all, but the metric goes up anyway, and so it looks like we're doing a great job. Or like the relationship between the things that we do and the outcomes that we're, kinda, we're trying to create, those are complex a lot of the time. Sometimes you're doing some very small thing that has a subtle influence on the user experience. And that's a good thing to do, but you know it's never going to have some outcome that you can measure in terms of some high-level metric. So do, should we stop doing those things? No, I think that we should have research-led practice. We should embrace the complexity of the work that we do. We should, instead of thinking about high-level metrics, which, I mean, we can do that as well, but I think the proper concern of teams that are building software is about detailed answers to complex questions, you know, th these kind of questions, right, the kind of things that, you know, you actually care about when you're building, the, the things about how users are being influenced by the, the, the impact on users of the software that you're building. And I think it's hard for executives to work in this paradigm because they want to feel like they have control, you know, they want to be able to push a lever and say, you know, we're going to turn up the, turn up the dollars, you know, and I, and I'm sympathetic to that need for them to feel like they can see results of what's happening. But I think that as data professionals, we, we don't do anyone any favours by masking the complexity of what's going on. I think that we need to be advocates for this more complex view of the world, advocates for seeing the people behind the data and understanding things at that level. And I think we can also help to promote that way of thinking by being good communicators of that data. So that's research-led practice. This is the end of my talk. Hopefully it's been long enough to like cover my... Ooh, okay, we're going to do questions. Um, <laughs> but first I've got some conclusions. Um, I think the way that data science is often thought of, the way that... It's definitely the way that it's taught in universities from people who actually went to university, tell me. Um, <laughs> It, the idea is that you get this, this nice, tidy data set and you do some sort of really flash maths on it, some cool algorithm, and you get some results. And I think often the, the realm of data science is seen as being about getting the, making that algorithm smarter, you know, getting better. We know we've got good results when we can, because we can measure them statistically. And that, that is all important stuff. But I guess what the main thing that I'm trying to argue for in this talk is that actually we should see our realm as professionals as this, right? That, that data is produced by people and the results that we produce are seen by people. That there's, it is a, a cyclical system that we work in and that our, our job encapsulates all of that. We have to sort of make friends with the people and see them as an integral part of the work that we do. 
and that means working more closely with user experience, with customer service representatives, understanding, you know, with, with design, taking a, a more holistic view of the, uh, of the system that we're working in. So that is data as a soft science. This is me. You can get in touch with me. Thank you very much. Yeah.